Kilimanjaro. The name in Swahili means shining mountain. At almost 20,000 feet, it rises above the clouds. Kilimanjaro is the highest freestanding mountain and one of the tallest volcanoes in the world. It supports a surprising variety of environments, from lush tropical rainforests to frigid polar-like glaciers. But in recent years, the glaciers which surround the summit have been shrinking. In the last century, 80% of them have disappeared. And what if a catastrophic event should occur, just like the landslide at Mount St. Helens in 1980? This international expedition will risk the hazards of high-altitude mountaineering, searching for answers to new scientific questions. Now there is a critical question about this mountain that symbolizes Africa. Is Kilimanjaro dying? Join the expedition in Volcano Above the Clouds, up next on NOVA. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the Park Foundation, dedicated to education and quality television. Science. It's given us the framework to help make wireless communications clear. Sprint is proud to support NOVA. We see an inventor. At Microsoft, your potential inspires us to create software that helps you reach it. Your potential, our passion. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. An island in the sky, the highest mountain in Africa, Kilimanjaro. 40 miles wide, covering an area 50 times the size of Manhattan, its massive flanks create their own microclimate. The water which flows off Kilimanjaro is vital to the mountain's varied plant life. And the isolation of its forests has allowed for many species to evolve. It's a paradise, especially for those who want to study its unusual environments. This is magical. Robin Buxton is a naturalist who has dedicated his life understanding the area around Kilimanjaro. Meeting Puwa. I was born in East Africa, and it's a place that I've always come back to. Now there are concerns that Kilimanjaro is dying, and that's important both for the people who live on the mountain and for the visitors from all over the world who visit it. I'm going to try and climb Kilimanjaro, which will be very difficult for me, but I think it's well worth doing if we can answer some of these questions about its health. Robin has also spent his life overcoming a personal tragedy. At the age of two, when Robin and his family were living here, he contracted polio, leaving him permanently disabled. The same infection killed his father. Robin has always wanted to climb this mountain. It will be a supreme test of his abilities, but he feels an urgency to do it now. When the first European travelers came to this part of East Africa, they were astonished to discover that high above the plains rose a mountain. So astonished that at first they were unsure whether the snow on its top was really cloud cover. Kilimanjaro is so big that it creates its own weather system. And the clouds, which often cover the mountain, provide rainfall for the many Tanzanians who live nearby. They too are desperately concerned that the mountain may be dying, putting their livelihoods at risk. Robin is meeting an old Tanzanian friend, Michael Nagatalue, 
a park ranger and naturalist who has been with him on previous expeditions, but has never climbed Kilimanjaro. Hi, Michael. Hi, Robin. It's very, very good to see you. Me too. Yeah? How are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm okay. And your family? They are all fine. They're all fine. Yes. Excellent. Yes. For Michael, as for Robin, this will be an adventure. Africa's eastern tip is scarred by the Great Rift, a fracture zone running from north to south. Along the fault lines lie volcanoes small and large. But in Tanzania, the biggest dwarfs them all, Kilimanjaro. The climb is a hard one. Only a third of those who set off for the summit ever manage to reach it. The route will take them past the villages around the mountain, up through the forest, and then over the volcanic plateau until they reach the steep cone at the center. The reason to climb Mount Kilimanjaro is uh, I really want to get to the highest point. And that snow on top of that mountain, it's really makes me like a dream I'm just trying to think how could I get there with a difficult weather also I would like to touch that snow and to get close to it in a tropical area it's amazing things to have snow on the mountain the only snow I see maybe on the television in the Europe or some places in America or whatever this is snow, but uh, in Africa, this is a really amazing thing. So I'm proud and I'll be happy if I'll get there and to see the things like that. Michael will be one of the few Tanzanians to try to go up Kilimanjaro. The mountaineering equipment is too expensive. So most of the people who live around the mountain have never climbed it, except for those hired to support foreign expeditions. But these Tanzanians view the mountain as an essential part of their local culture because it provides them with fertile soil for their crops. So, your daughter is Edita. Yes. What does she like to do? She likes sports, writing, like, yeah? and reading. Why she's, she, actually, she, she don't know. Yes. But, uh, but she, she pretends. Pretend, yeah. Great. And she's very talkative. Very, very the talkative. local Tanzanians have developed what they call the tree farming system where huge trees provide shade for the crops growing below. I'm used to farming systems where yeah. there's one crop and here we've got trees to give shade, we've got bananas, we've got these yams, we've got coffee. Yeah. Why do we have such a complicated way of growing crops? Yeah, if you look behind here, this tall tree, yeah. and this is to give shade for this coffee. And then the bananas, they like the shade too? The banana, yes, they need moisture and a little bit wet, so they grow very well. And does this help the soil? Exactly. And yeah. without the trees and without the bananas and everything, the soil would go and the water would also go? Exactly. It's the water flowing off Kilimanjaro that is so vital to the health of the mountain and to the Tanzanians who live around it. The question Robin and Michael need to answer is whether the shrinking glaciers will also dry up Kilimanjaro's vital water supply. Where does all this water come from? This water comes from the mountain. Yes. Which part of the mountain? From the top? The answer is not a simple one. While the melting glaciers supply some of the water, there is also rainfall generated in the extensive forests on the slopes of Kilimanjaro. And as we go further up, yeah. we find real cloud forests. Yeah. And in the cloud forest, right, it doesn't necessarily rain, but the clouds form in among the trees and the water condenses on the trees. Yes. And that is a still important source of water, though much higher up than we are here. Yes. As you see, because there's a plenty of water running down. The mountain has evolved numerous ways to trap the water. As Robin and Michael walk up, seemingly every surface has mosses, ferns, and other plants growing so that moisture can be retained. The whole cloud forest acts as a gigantic sponge, making it a naturalist's paradise. This is magical. So, Robin, are you okay to climb the mountain? I think we have to see. Jumbo. Jumbo. I don't feel very confident at all. Why? Because it's very, very high. It's a very long walk. But I think we must try to do it, mustn't we? 
the things which is will become very hard for Robin to work out. It's a little bit mud and sleepy because he, he, he tends to use a lot of energy to, uh, to go a little bit higher. It's really hard work for him. By the way, I think he could manage to do it, no matter it's hard or whatever. As Robin and Michael get higher and higher up in the cloud forest, they begin to see some of the plants that have made Kilimanjaro so famous. Because the mountain is so isolated, it has evolved many of its own species. Indeed, it's said that there are more species unique to Kilimanjaro than there are to some entire countries. Kilimanjaro is sometimes described as an island in the sky because it has evolved its own unique ecosystem which may now be at risk. For Robin and Michael to move further up the mountain, they will need the support of a full expedition with porters and all the equipment necessary for high altitude mountaineering. Here we are, uh, where we set off onto the mountain proper. It's absolute pandemonium, lots of people looking for workers, porters, people being matched to the loads we've got, and uh, really quite a, quite a chaotic scene. The vehicles have had trouble bringing the kit to this point, stuck in the mud and things like that, so we're a lot later setting off than we'd hoped to be. It's going to be a bit of a saga getting to camp before it's dark. Joining Robin and Michael is German geologist Volker Lorenz, a world expert on volcanoes. Exact. We're in a position now, all these, bo these three boxes and these six. Another geologist, Kevin Doherty, already knows the mountain well and is the team's leader. So these are all the they must carry all the normal supplies, plus the extra film equipment. That means a total of 50 porters will be needed for the early stages of the climb. It's going to be a tough trip for everyone. The Tanzanians all come from the lowland area around the mountain, so they are not acclimatized to high altitude living. This shows very well how the small holdings are moving up into the forest area and forest being cleared the whole time to make way for farming. It's been interesting to see the state of the forest. Tanzania, of course, needs the timber. It's, it's an economic resource, it's a very important resource. But from the point of view of the Kilimanjaro ecosystems, it breaks up the natural forest in a way which makes it very difficult for animals to move between bits of the forest. Having said that, we've just seen colobus monkeys in the pine trees, which is very interesting. In some ways, that's encouraging, but I think the fact that one species is prepared to use the pines doesn't necessarily mean that everything in the garden's rosy. This huge number of children around, all their families, the population's growing the whole time on the mountain. Lots of people all the way up here, very nearly to the edge of the national park. It's always exciting, this point, and uh, the feeling that we're really starting the, the top part of an expedition and get to the, to the high ground. You'll probably hear me get breathless because we're here at about 9,000 feet and uh, breathing starts to get a bit more difficult. Yes, then. Finally, after many hours of packing, the expedition begins. After two days of climbing, the team is above the trees and are now at the same elevation as the clouds. They've reached a region of heathers that grow in this dry soil, and like many other plants on Kilimanjaro, can reach unusual heights. For Volker Lorenz, this is his first sight of the volcanic craters that cover Kilimanjaro. For Kilimanjaro is not just one volcano, but three. 800,000 years ago, a series of eruptions resulted in the first of these, Mount Shira, rising up from the East African plain. Then another giant volcano formed to the east, Mawenzi. Finally, only 300,000 years ago, a volcano called Kibo erupted between these two peaks, climbing on the shoulders of the two existing giants to become one of the tallest volcanoes in the world. However, the craters have since eroded especially that of Shira, the oldest, which the team is now crossing. Oh, that's a nice piece. Volker and Kevin are trying to determine precisely how the craters collapsed, because this may forecast what happens to Kilimanjaro in the future. 
These vesicles, they are the result of the magma. Until recently, scientists assumed that the roof of the craters had simply caved in. Since St. Helens, there's a new model because of the steep slopes and some eruptions and material moving in from below, you get slope instability and a lot of material is moving sideways. And the idea at present is moving to the north and you get a big scar like at St. Helens. Volker is concerned that Kilimanjaro may do what St. Helens did in 1980, not erupt, but suffer a landslide, ripping open the side of the mountain and releasing a pyroclastic flow that devastated a huge area around it. The forests for seven miles around St. Helens were completely wiped out. Looking at Kibo, the main summit of Kilimanjaro, Volker and Kevin can see that the rim had collapsed at one point in time from just such a landslide. Could a more serious one happen? And would it release the magma from deep below the surface? I'm sure this, this crater has a long history. It probably was much deeper than it is today. And then it was filled. It looks like we've got some lion prints here. I'm quite oh, surprised to see these here, actually, at this altitude. Um, these I know, are real lions? Yeah, these are certainly lion prints. I mean, have a look at the size of them. That They are lion prints. I thought they disappeared long ago. I've, I've not seen any evidence of them for a long time. Do you have your altimeter on you? Just a moment. This is um, quite unusual for up here. And uh, certainly lion, without a shadow of doubt, and quite recent as well. It's it r rained heavily two days ago, so certainly in the last... Um, 3,645 meters. Which is about pretty much exactly 12,000 feet. These crystals where this actually yeah. froze over last night, and if you look carefully in here, there's no evidence no, of that, which means this could be, could have occurred early this morning or, or certainly within the last 24 so hours. So the lion could guess. still be around? Oh, absolutely. It lives, it, it, there's lion up here, and um, I should think this lion's territory is this greater. Mm -hmm. It's frightening here. They have lions up here. It, it's, it's frightening, but where there's food, there's lion. Robin is lagging behind the others. The strain of crossing the great volcanic crater of Shira is beginning to show. It's taking him twice as long as the rest of the party to get from camp to camp, even though he is pushing himself as hard as he can. But he has climbed mountains of a similar height before, and he is determined to climb this one. It was a longer walk than I expected. I got very exhausted on it. We've come up apparently only a thousand feet from where we camped last night, um, but uh, it felt like an awful lot more than that, and I was really cold when I got in my tent, so got in the puffer jacket and the sleeping bag, and I'm warming up now, but I feel a lot better. Mild sickness threw something out of the system, and uh, that often, often helps to clear things. Um, so that's how I am, and uh, it's going to be a, quite a recovery story overnight, I think. Um, arms are feeling quite sore, because I've used my sticks a heck of a lot today. But we're here, and there's a wonderful sunset out there. Isn't that just gorgeous? The sun sliding down the southern slope of Meru and orange glow spreading under the clouds to the north of there. But I'm feeling, I'm feeling quite cold sitting here in the mouth of my tent. And it'd uh, be good to, good to feel warmer. So that's part, partly that story is just time and keeping in the sleeping bag and the puffer jacket and partly it's stealing myself to eat something which doesn't feel at all appetizing at the moment. But that's typical of altitude, so... It's just the sort of thing we have to cope with and, um, and say, well, tough, you've got to eat, man. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else care for some whiskey? Oh, cheers. cheers. Prost. Prost, cheers. Michel. At the end of the day, safety is our biggest concern, and the weather isn't, isn't it's, it's still continuing to be foul. Um, so what yeah. can, so it's raining down here, but it's probably, what, what would it be snowing up there? It is snowing up there because... At the, the team has a problem. They are trying to get up to the western breach the dip in the side of the mountain caused by a landslide. But much more snow has fallen than is normal for this time of year. But the point is, is that the reason that we've actually come at this time of year is it should be, it, there should be very little snow, if any at all. Mm -hmm. I backed off last year with four clients off the western breach. We had the intention of going up, just with guides, up to the summit and down the Barafu route. Yeah. We're actually talking about, in much worse conditions, going up. Oh, we we don't know what the conditions are like. We know they're worse. Oh. I've talked to people who've been up in January few years ago and they were saying they thought I could probably manage it but then it was it was very dry there's no snow up the route to go up 
actually. Mm -hmm. um, what I like to do, particularly at this point when we're climbing higher up on the mountain, is to slow the pace down and to keep moving rather than take lots of stops and just at a very, very slow pace to enable us to acclimatise as we're moving. Mm -hmm. I'm actually inclined to get Robin out before the rest of us, um, if that's OK sure. with you. Um, 5.30. Uh, for Robin as a time to wake up and preferably leaving... I, I better miss dinner and go to bed then, Kev. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Robin, would you like a cup of tea? A bit cold. It's a cold one, is it? Yeah, it's frosted. Ah. There you that'll, go. That'll bring life to the system. That's brilliant. Do you have a headache? Feel fine? No, no headache. Excellent, excellent. Kilimanjaro is famous for the mist and bad weather that can descend on the mountain. Together with the cold and the altitude, it can make conditions hard for any expedition. After a while, it becomes too difficult for Robin, and the porters suggest that they take turns carrying him. Well, if you tip me in the stream, it'll be a well-deserved bath, even if it's rather cold. Because I think I'm beginning to smell on this mountain. man seemed to enjoy it as much as I think I did, which is, uh, he, he's uh, one, of our, one of our real stalwarts, obviously, and uh, great credit to him for saying that that was the easiest way to get me down there, because I think that could have taken me two hours to walk down that scree slope quite easily. And uh, with this mist and cloud and being able to see 20 yards sometimes, it's been rather depressing at times and thinking, where the hell are we? Robin and Michael find themselves descending into a sheltered dip beside the mountain. Here there is a valley full of giant senecio, a plant that usually grows to only a few feet, but here towers above them. It's a magical place. Kilimanjaro is known for its giant plant life. In the morning when the skies clear, this enormous valley is revealed. It is called Barranco, and it is where the greatest concentration of Kilimanjaro's most unusual plants can be found. Well, Michael, we talked about looking forward to finding the Senecios, and here we are with a great forest of them. Isn't this exciting? Yeah. This nearest one seems to have the remains of flowers on it. Yes. And I can't see the remains of flowers on any of the others, so I think flowering must be a fairly rare event. Yeah. It's like old leather, isn't it, these leaves? The water just goes down into this part because this is, it's look like more softy, and then it collects uh, some sort of water. And it keeps it keeps in uh, in in that leaves. The evolutionary process of these plants is even affecting the dead part, isn't it? So that it doesn't decay away and fall off, but it okay. stays with the plant. This has several layers. That this is a very very thick layer of insulation. We've just been. I hope we we can put this back nicely for the for the yeah. plant's duvet tonight because it yeah. needs that. All the plants in the Barranco Valley have been forced to adapt to the tough mountain environment. These lobelia have evolved a unique survival strategy. They store a type of sugar, which prevents the plant from freezing each night and losing moisture during the warmer days. This is a common plant in an altitude like this, and it's grow only in this altitude, 3,800 meters. And it's amazing to think this is, this is so closely related, it's the same genus as things people grow in hanging baskets in English gardens. And it's so very, very different. I think the Barranco here, while it's stark, and it's got all this rock around it. It's a very, very live place, and my interest in biology and ecology, interest in why plants like these giant senecios, these giant brown sauce, the giant lobelias, why they're giants, why other things are so silvery, all the plants around, and you can see in the background, why they've come to reflect the light. That is what really fascinates me. It's the interaction of the altitude, the extremes of cold and heat and light, and how those plants and animals really cope with the difficulties that it presents. And perhaps it's a bit of a privilege to have been able to come here to experience for myself some of that difficulty that these things are adapted to live with the whole time.
Meanwhile, the team is still concerned that there might be too much snow on the mountain. Kevin decides to send an advance party to see if the route is passable. Our biggest concern is the fact that we're taking up 25 porters up the mountain, um, plus about 10 of us and um, around eight guides as well. We're a big, big party. We're about 40 people. And it looks like there's been quite a lot of snow melt in the last few days. And with that amount of people, it's got to be safe. How far do you want to go up there today? And how far do you think it's necessary to go up to have a good look? It's for three hours, up to four hours. But um, beyond our glacier, how far do you expect to go? About third halfway up. Third halfway up. Kilimanjaro's notoriously turbulent weather system can close in on a climbing expedition with frightening speed. Kevin's principal worry is whether Robin will be able to make it. My main concern for Robin is the fact there's still a lot of snow on the western breach and um, that, that'll make it quite awkward for him. And more importantly, if he were to, to not succeed, to come down off the western breach with snow is, is quite tricky. The second reason is he's been quite under the weather in, on the first few days on the mountain. I think that's paid its toll. And on top of that is, is the fact that it's altitude as well. It's quite high. The altitude's having a bit of an impact. When the advance party returns, they report the route to the summit is just passable, although very difficult because of the heavy snow. Each individual team member must now decide whether they should go up or down. Well, we've come a long way in seven days on the mountain. and. Uh, I've decided that for me to go to the top with the amount of snow on the mountain is really asking an awful lot of myself and of the people who have to look after me in this process. So my decision is that the team goes on and they're fit and strong and they'll see all the things that we wanted to do. But for me, I shall walk out along this sort of contour, somewhere between 13 and 14,000 feet. One of the things in my mind is, of course, that mountains do claim lives and Kilimanjaro is no exception there. The idea that one should go to the top at all costs is not something that's ever really appealed to me. Rock and ice are not really my environment at all, but it would be nice to, to claim to have done it. Um, so it's, it's been a bit of a twinge to come to that decision. But I think it's the right one for everybody here. The team can move much less encumbered. They can get to their objectives. They can get the questions they need to answer answered, the things they need to look at, particularly the glaciers and the top of the volcano looked at. Yes, there's a little bit of a, a sense of sadness, sadness that my own strength isn't good enough to say, yes, let's face the challenge. But truth is, I have a family. In fact, one of my children's on the train to, to school at the moment. And um, they come first. Robin's decision that he have to go down. Uh, I support him. That's a good decision. No matter we were together in our plan to go all the way to the top. But uh, so far, this is a good decision. Does, for him, okay. this height, it's I'm quite far enough for him. To help him up. I'll miss him very much. But that's the option. He have to go down according to this weather and also it's quite a lot for him to continue so I miss him but uh, still it's fine for him to go down. See you later Volker. See you later. See you in a week's time. Have a good long walk. Well I hope you. Short walk. <laughs> I hope you have an even better walk. Yeah. Up the top. Nice up the top. There. Yeah yeah. Just wave from the top and we'll be looking out I'll for do you. so. <laughs> and I hope, it's, the best I hope it's very interesting. Good good. Thank yeah, you Kevin. See you Robin. Well done. See you. See you. Come really well. Great. Brilliant. See you later. Okay, 20. Take care of them. Michael will now try to answer some of the questions that Robin was most concerned about, particularly whether the disappearing glaciers on the top of the mountain are important sources of water. The team decides to begin their two day assault on the western breach. As they climb even higher into the clouds, they pass a great volcanic formation rising out of the mist. It's known as Lava Tower. They are now approaching the snow line.
they find some meltwater here, but clearly not enough to sustain the forests below. At this altitude, just below the western breach, little plant life survives, and the cold is just as hostile to humans. In the thin air and low temperatures, tempers rapidly flare over the issue of how to best put up the tents. Here, where we are now, it's, we are at uh, uh, Aro Glacier. So we are overnight here. It's cold, and it's difficult to tell you uh, how much, how many centigrade, but uh, it's, I mean, it's a freezing cold. So, and uh, sometimes it's, it's hard to breathe, and you get it difficult. And I see the snow, and uh, so far, it's not uh, very scares me as I thought before, and uh, I still feel comfortable, and I hope I will get there and uh, I will manage to get to the top. Tomorrow we plan to go to the crater, and uh, we plan to overnight two nights over there. Then we will see what we will arrange for the, for the next leg to, uh, to the summit. We have almost a full moon, we're covered in mist, we can't see where we're going and at this point, quite honestly, it's um, very apprehensive and all I want to do is get up the hill and get it over and done with and that's usually how I feel at this, this stage in proceedings on the mountain. The night before the, the summit I always just wish I was walking on it. it, you know, I can't wait till I wake up in the morning and actually get it over and done with. At 18,000 feet, walking up the rock face of the western breach is a phenomenal physical challenge. With little oxygen in the air, every step becomes a real effort. The team is worried that if they don't get up the western breach fast enough, the strong sun will melt the recently fallen snow and release rock falls. The quicker we get out of here, the better. Huh? The quicker we move on from here, the better. Really? You're not happy with me? The best place to stop is like, you see this cliff on our left, some location like that, or yeah. even where this lot are, but in the rocks. So anything that comes down from the cliffs above, bounce over. After an exhausting 12-hour climb, they finally emerge on the plateau just below the summit. This is where the great glaciers surround the volcanic crater of Kilimanjaro. Oh! Gee, that's the glacier. Unbelievable. Here I am, top of this big volcano. At lunchtime, I almost fell asleep. So I was exhausted, I was tired, didn't sleep too well last night, but then realizing we get closer and closer to the rim, the summit rim, I felt invigorated. I certainly would like to be down there and look into the crater. We'll go down there and have a look. Is it what you expected, Volker? Ah, it's, it's even more. I mean, I've seen photographs of this, but to see, stand here and look at it, it's, that's something different. It's more exciting. Absolutely. Can you smell the sulfur? Oh, yes. I've just had a strong whiff of it. That it's is really exciting. 
Absolutely. It's such steep walls. It's a collapse crater. About 100 years ago, there was rumour that local people around here saw emissions coming out of here, but um, it's not actually been documented. I mean, some, this could be relatively recent. Oh, yes, the rim deposits, the grey rim, which is nicely to be seen, looks very, very young. Because it's so uniform as well. Yeah. But of course, I do not know... All the indicators show that the volcano may have erupted within the last several hundred years, meaning it can still be regarded as potentially active. To determine just how active Kilimanjaro might become, they need to descend into the bowl at its center. Here, in the oxygen-starved atmosphere, the heat of the crater floor and severe cold make it seem as if they are walking on the moon. Volker and Kevin are looking for fumaroles, the vents from which volcanic gases escape into the atmosphere. This section seems very active. I think let's have a try over here. This is very fresh. This is warm as well, very hot here. Is it? Hold on, this is an active one. Oh, ow. The soil ow. is hot. Let's, think? let's take a reading, I think. These, ow, this one's hot as well. And there's um, moisture on my fingers. These, ah, these two the are certainly active. Condensating steam. By taking the temperature of these fumaroles, they can okay, estimate where the magma lies below the crater's surface. OK, hold it, hold it, even if you burn your fingers. Oh, thank you. Doesn't matter. OK, the, the reading is 78.5. 78.5? Yeah. There's steam coming out. Yeah. Quite a bit. Reading is 77.2. OK. Take it out. Have it. Well, it hasn't melted. No, no, no. The fact that there are such high temperatures and sulfur deposits on the inner ring of the crater indicates that there is active magma close to the surface. Volker estimates just 400 feet below. Wow. This is really something. It is, eh? It's very it's steep. Spectacular. I would assume something like 100 meters? Across? No, deep. Oh, sorry. I think we can, we can actually see the bottom. Oh, yes. At least 100 meters. It's a magnificent crater. Just like the side of the mountain, the crater walls here are very steep and potentially unstable, making a landslide a serious possibility. It could also expose the molten rock at the center of the volcano. When I saw the glacier for the first time, it looked like something uh, which is, I didn't expect it uh, to see in my eyes. It's really, I cannot explain. And it's something which is very beautiful. The glaciers I expected to see is just like the one I see in the pictures, in the flat surface. But uh, the one I see now, it's uh, totally different. And it's really, really amazing because it's something like a tower a big tower of the glaciers. It's the rising warm air given off by the volcano that sculpts the glaciers into such fanciful shapes. And it's atmospheric radiation that causes most of the water from the glaciers to evaporate. As Michael studies the glaciers, it's clear that they are not a major source of water for the mountain. The glaciers of Kilimanjaro are shrinking. Recent research has shown this is likely due to global warming and other causes. The glaciers have been consistently retreating since the German explorer Hans Meyer first climbed the mountain in 1889. It wasn't until 1912 that the first real survey was done of the ice cap. According to the latest research, since that time, about 80% of the ice field has vanished. 
and the heat from the volcano below is another factor. But whatever the cause of the melting, it is estimated that by 2015, the glaciers will all be gone. If glaciers disappear on Kilimanjaro, I feel so sad because if a glacier disappear, that means it will be a lot of problem and also the beauty of this mountain will disappear. Early the next morning, the team sets off to reach the actual summit, still almost a thousand feet above the crater plateau. This will be their last climb through the snow. The music helps me very much up here because it keeps me in a rhythm when I'm walking. Now I'm walking, I have to follow this pace, so it helps me very much. When Hans Meyer first climbed the peak, he named it Kaiser Wilhelm Spitze, after the German emperor. But after Tanzania achieved its independence in 1961, it was renamed Uhuru Peak as a symbol of African liberation. The word Uhuru in Swahili means simply freedom. Woo! I'm ready. I can't believe it. Whoa. Top of the world. Ah, the highest point in Africa. This is the point of my dream. Oh, man. Wow. Look at that. A massive view. The glaciers. Oh. Hard to believe. Yeah. Here we are. Look at that view, eh? The top of Africa. Thank you. Michael. Congratulations. Yeah, fine. <laughs> Here is it here. Yeah. Here we are. Yeah, well done, Volker. That is. It's yeah, hard to Kilimanjaro. believe. Oh. Oh. It is. They the brought it in back of them Africa. The, the biggest volcano of them all. Okay. There we are, exactly. look at that. Exactly. <laughs> Hello, Robin. Hello, is that you, Mike? Yes. Where up are you? I'm on the top now. On the top of the whole? Yes, I made it. What's it? It's very cold up here, and uh, I'm happy I made it. Excellent. What can you see? I can see the Heim Glacier, and I can see the crater. How do you feel? I feel okay. A little bit tired, but I'm okay. And did Volker make it with you? Yes, Volker ma made it too. Well, listen, maybe we can fly up and see the mountain together later, because I think that's the only way I'm going to see it now. Okay. Take care coming down then, Michael. Thank you. I hope to see you again. Bye, Robin. See you when I get there. I regret quite a lot not going to the top. The walk down was, was pretty hard for me, and I needed a lot of help from the guys who came with me and the porters. I think it was definitely the right decision. From what I've heard from the rest of the crew who went up the Western Breach, they had a hard time. It was slippery and icy. And uh, I think from the point of view of, of everything we've been trying to do, definitely the right decision that I should have walked around. Robin's decision, though a personal setback, contributed to the safety and success of the expedition. For the team, six days of strenuous walking had put them into position on the barren plateau just below the summit. From there, 
Some climbed another 12 hours to reach almost 20,000 feet. Overall, the expedition had met its goal. The team had reached the top of the mountain. They now know that these glaciers formed more than 11,000 years ago are sensitive indicators of climate change. But Robin also believes that it's likely the plant life on and around Kilimanjaro will continue to thrive. Whether the shrinking is due to the end of an ice age, the heat of the volcano, or to global warming, Robin and Michael may be among the last to see the beauty of the glaciers on this majestic mountain. On NOVA's website, the adventure continues beyond Kilimanjaro, the African continent's tallest peak. Explore the highest mountain on each of the seven continents at pbs.org. To order this show or any other NOVA program for $19.95 plus shipping and handling, call WGBH Boston Video at 1-800-255-9424. Nova is a production of WGBH Boston. Major funding for Nova is provided by the Park Foundation, dedicated to education and quality television. We see Teacher of the Year. We see kids reaching their potential. It's what inspires us to create software that helps you reach yours. Science. It's given us the framework to help make wireless communications clear. Sprint is proud to support Nova. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions.